Welcome to Faith and Politics, a show dedicated to discussing issues surrounding the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics or your politics starting to shape your faith. In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson. Let me introduce you to our panelists for today. First, we have Mr. Todd McFarlane, who's a deputy general counsel for the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have with us also Mr. Tim Schultz, who's the president of the First Amendment Partnership. We have Mr. Lawrence Brown, who's a senior pastor of the Queensboro Seventh-day Adventist Church in New York City. And we have Dr. Timothy Golden, a professor of philosophy at Whitman College. Gentlemen, appreciate having you here with us and looking forward to our conversations for today. You know, there's an interesting concept going on where there's a question regarding where you can use chaplains. And there was a matter that came up with the Episcopalians that were joined by a hundred other chaplains in signing a letter urging local school boards in Texas to vote against putting chaplains in public schools, calling the efforts to enlist religious counselors in public classrooms as being harmful to students and to families. You know, this came just a little bit later after we had seen the Texas board taking a look at other questions where they wanted to pass or really vote against similar measures. But the legislation had been pushed by activists. It had been associated with the concept of Christian nationalism. And now we have this question whether or not seeing chaplains being in a school system or seeing some type of religious connections connecting with something that's quote unquote public as being a problem. You know, when I take a look at a situation like this, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what on earth we are trying to figure out, you know, Tim Schultz, when you see something like this, how do we know when we've gone too far? How do we know when we are actually combining that issue of church and state or religion and government and really causing a problem for society in, in general? I think there's two principles. One is we can look at the history of a practice and say, is this a, is this a practice that goes back to the founding? Or is this a practice that's genuinely new? So you you talk, for instance, about military chaplains, or you talk about the, the Senate chaplain, right? Uh, those offices go back to the founding era when the principles of the separation of church and state were enacted. So when you have a historical practice, um, that's a strong indi indication that it's that it's on the right side of the line. I think then you look at the the surrounding context. You look at things like analogy, right? You say things like, "Well, we have military chaplains everywhere, right? We have uh, chaplains for legislative bodies. We have chaplains for uh, for colleges. Is it is it bad that we would also have chaplains for high school students when uh, we have a, a cottage industry of counseling and mental health, and we have an explosion of mental health challenges?" Would we say that extending the idea of chaplains into high schools is also a good idea? I think so. You look at history and you look at analogy to other current practices that we widely see to be legitimate. But I guess when you start taking a look at this, Todd, and we start really considering that we are now talking about possibly bringing in somebody with, quote unquote, faith based training that are not just being called in to be counseling. But chaplains usually have a religious connotation attached. And it's one thing in the military. It's one thing in a hospital. But when you put it in a school, you know, does that completely change the whole dynamic? Well, or I don't think having a chaplain in a school, even a public school, is problematic in and of itself. I think the challenge was the, the way that this program was being implemented. Mm. First of all, these people were called chaplains. There wasn't any particular requirement for training or background. There is an entire very rigorous process for people to become chaplains. And U.S. military has that in place. Hospitals have that in place. Corrections have that in place. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has its own uh, endorsement agency for chaplains. I've been legal advisor of that for a number of years. These were just individuals who called themselves chaplain and came in to provide certain counseling services. They had no what's known as CPE credit, continuing pastoral edu uh, education. They had no background or training in this. And I think that is the problem because true chaplains, one of the prerequisites is they're able to work in a multi-faith environment. So even though you're a Catholic priest, even though you're a Baptist chaplain, even though you're Seventh-day Adventist or a Muslim, you were able to minister to and provide those services to people on a cross-faith basis. Now, there's certain things you're not going to be able to do. A Protestant chaplain is not going to be able to hear confession or give uh, mass and so on, uh, but they're still going to be able to uh, to minister to their people who are other of 
of other than their faith. And I think that was what this program was missing. Uh, an actually run pro chaplain program is in certain contexts, I think absolutely required. For instance, in the military, right? If you're on a ship somewhere or you're posted overseas, you do not have access to any religious services outside of what the military provides you. But Lawrence, how do we start to differentiate here? It sounds like maybe there might have been a question of, is this really more of a counselor as opposed to a chaplain? But I think the use of the word chaplain made it very clear they wanted some type of religious connotation connected to this, and that's why the ACLU and other groups seem to get aggressively involved in this conversation. What are we missing here? Well, you see, that's what makes me nervous. We, we live uh, in an environment today where a large segment of our society has shown no compunction whatsoever when it comes to blurring lines and eradicating best practices and, and good government norms, you know, and with that being the precedent that they're setting, I look at something like this and I say to myself, here we go again. Because um, if you send your child uh, to a public school, there are certain givens that come along with that. And the energy and the effort that they're exercising to try and make something like this happen. It's like the old saying, if the camel gets his head in the tent, you know, the hump is gonna follow. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is just another situation where look out for the hump, cause here it comes, if they're allowed to proceed this way. Yeah, I have serious doubts about any legislation coming A, out of Texas, and B, supported by Christian nationalists. So I, I far be it for me to question the sincerity of any individual's religious persuasion, but I think it would be naive to suggest that there's a segment of Christianity in America that is far less interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ than it is in amassing political power by any means necessary, more often than not at the state level. So for me, I'm a little suspicious of, of the legislation that was pending, and I, I just think that we are living in an age now in which uh, people feel emboldened. Uh, people have always, there's always been fringe elements in Christianity on, on the right and left, frankly. Uh, there's always been fringe elements, but I think this, uh, this legislation is ultimately a bridge too far, and it speaks to the precise reason why we don't want Public, we don't. I mean, if if you have public schools uh, hiring chaplains, that's an implicit understanding that the public school or that agents of the school are endorsing a certain religious viewpoint. And what do you say to a student who would rather attend school without having that pressure put on him or her uh, about religious belief? I mean, that's part of the reason in some sense why people send their kids to public school is to not have that kind of pressure put on them. So I, again, Christian nationalists and Texas, they, they really make me raise my eyebrows about what this is really all about. Let's have some spice here. Cause I, I think I agree with uh, Dr. Golden on a couple things and on most things, but not on this. I think one, I don't think we should be suspicious because it's Texas any more than we ought to be suspicious because Dr. Golden lives in, uh, you know, Seattle. Like, I, I just don't think that we ought to say, hey, it's we know how those people think. I I, I just I don't think that's a good uh, way of of sort of deciding uh, rightness and wrongness. The second thing is just to the substance, right, of of this. I agree that this particular iteration of the chaplain program looks problematic mm. because it doesn't have the kinds of safeguards that we normally have in chaplain programs, right. including the one in the U.S. Senate, including the ones in the military. At the same time, the idea that in principle we're worried about, you know, high schoolers and public schools getting religion forced on them, they already have all kinds of quasi-religious beliefs, metaphysical beliefs that they're being taught that are just secular metaphysics that have no basis in reality. So the idea that like that we just – we wall off high schools – from uh, from chaplain programs at all or from I, – I, I don't agree with that either.
Well, Tim, I have to push back against you on this, and I sure. think we're just going to have to really disagree. Yes, students in schools are beset with all kinds of beliefs and ideas, but the Constitution doesn't prohibit those. What the Constitution does does prohibit is officials who are acting under color of state law or state authority, i.e. people who work at schools like chaplains or teachers from doing things like leading prayer and so forth. There's all kinds of student-led groups in schools that uh, students can partake in, right? I'm thinking of the old West Side uh, School versus uh, Mergen's case from years ago under the Equal Access Act that allows for student groups to lead out and have their own pr- prayer groups, Bible study groups, worship groups in public school. But we can't have that kind of thing coming from people who are in positions of authority, yeah, but not yeah. from the standpoint of religion. And the problem, though, is I think it's just fundamentally wrong, and there's a lot of history on this, to say that just because a a governmental entity hires a chaplain, that means they're endorsing that particular view. We have chaplains hired in the federal government by all branches of the military. We have them hired by the Department of Corrections. We have them hired in Coast Guard, which is sort of a branch. We have chaplains and we have them in we have them also in public universities hiring a chaplain by itself is not problematic now you can argue about whether this particular program was truly a, a chaplain program but i just don't think you can say just because you hire someone means you're endorsing that view and the us military hires chaplains of all different faiths and and that i think is just an unwarranted attack on chaplaincy generally which again chaplains do a very good job of ministering in a multi-faith environment, and they don't force prayer on people. They provide for people's spiritual needs, which is a significant part of the population. And even for those who don't, they still provide secular services to them in times of need. Yeah, I, none, of I, the, I, none of the examples that you gave, the military, corrections, pr- prisons, et cetera, involve, uh, they all involve people who are above the age of majority, they don't. They're not, they're not, these are not these are not school age kids. No, so we're not absolutely. talking about. So wait a minute, Todd. Wait a minute. First of all, the the all the examples that you give are different for that reason. Second of all, if what are you hiring a chaplain to do in a public school if not to endorse a certain religious message and pass that message on? to school age kids. That that's exactly what that's exactly what the courts have said you're not supposed to do in an educational context in a public school. It is no, also No, I think you're wrong about that though. Yeah. Doc. I think you're just wrong. I think you're wrong on the law and I think my my issue with with the way you're reasoning about this is I think the concept that hey that that the that that everything is the chaplain programs are fine for those 18 and up. There's just nothing in the Constitution that, like, once you get below the age of 18, you can't have a chaplain program. That you're, I mean, respectfully, that's just not a legal concept that the Constitution recognizes. That's actually a kind of religious concept that you would be importing into the Constitution. And, and I just think you're, you're respectfully. Well, I, I, I think, that. and I think you're wrong on the law, Tim. So, I mean, in, in, in the words of, in the words of a, a good judge, I'd like to see some authority on that principle. <laughs> I'd well, like to think, hear some authority making, on that principle. I'm making the claim that people under the age of 18 are – that a chaplain program for people under the age of 18 is per se unconstitutional. That's the no, claim. Uh, that, that's that's not the claim. That's a straw man. What I'm well, saying is – Maybe I misunderstand your claim then. I'm, I'm not trying what, to straw man you. I want to understand your claim. What I'm saying is that courts the, – the Supreme Court in particular has recognized that there is a problem – with indoctrination when you are talking about school age children. Yeah. Now, when you consider that principle in light of the fact that I, I'm for the life of me, I'm trying to figure out why, what is a chaplain going to do? That's because why you would a, why would a, yeah. why would a That's public school, why would a public school hire a chaplain? If not to promote some sort of religious message. No chaplain. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Tim, this just stems from your lack of understanding of what chaplains do, because I can assure you, chaplains in 
every setting, whether that be the corporate setting, the hospitals, military corrections, including juvenile facilities. So your premise there is wrong. We have chaplains in juvenile facilities, which are under 18, are not there to indoctrinate. They're, they're not there to spread a particular message or gospel. That is not what chaplains do, and it's not what any good chaplain does. And chaplains who have tried to do that have found themselves on the wrong side and don't last very long. So Again, what chaplains do is provide services and support to people. They minister to people who want that. They minister to, to people who do not want a particular religious service. They provide all kinds of support in times of grief, in times of need, um, in coordinating things. For instance, in the military, if a family member dies, regardless of your faith, it's the chaplain that coordinates that person going back if it's a mother and father. There's all kinds of things that chaplains do from the U.S. Senate down to a juvenile facility, and none of them are there. I mean, I think we well, are talking past each other, right? Because I, I, I think, think so, but Dr. the thing that really Lawrence, distinguishes Lawrence, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Go ahead. The thing that I'm really- I'm still trying to figure out which one of those functions is not religious, but go ahead. Well, the thing that really distinguishes all of this is when you're talking about a public school, there's a dynamic there that's different from every other venue that has been identified as an example. And I think you've got to hold on to that distinction to understand why we've got to tread with caution. Well, let me just end it this way. I mean, I think this is a question that obviously, you know, begs the idea of, you know, counseling, chaplaincy, maybe a better understanding of what it might mean from an official or unofficial perspective. But it's not unusual that there's people that would hear the term chaplain and immediately start thinking about it from a religious standpoint. But this is a conversation that I think we could see having on in many jurisdictions for many times to come. But I appreciate you guys' comments on this. You know, there was an interesting case that I was looking at recently called United States versus Lindor, in which you have the Army Court of Criminal Appeals that rejected an appellant's claim that his murder sentence claimed that he was basically exercising his First Amendment rights under RIFRA. The case involved a staff sergeant who, after multiple attempts, succeeded in murdering his wife through the use of rituals and poisons recommended by a voodoo practitioner in Haiti. And the court said in part that the appellant's actions to summon voodoo rituals were consistent with his First Amendment right to freely exercise his religious beliefs. You know, the record goes on to really pull all some other information in as we start taking a look of what's going on as it relates to matters regarding the First Amendment, matters regarding RIFRA. But Tim Schultz, if we're getting to a point that someone can be protected from their religious actions as it has to do with rituals, and somehow poisons and other things are worked into it, which leads to the death of an individual, and somehow it isn't clear where we should be with this from a court standpoint or from a societal standpoint, or is this something where I am missing something here? Help me understand what's happening. Yeah, I mean, this, this case, you know, it sounds like an episode of Law and Order, you know, written during the writer's strike. I mean, it's a, the case is so, you know, the, the, the facts are, are, you know, seem to almost be made up. Here's the thing. People lots of times argue against things like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act by citing these kinds of hypotheticals. What if, what if somebody uh, wants to cite their religion for violence? What about crimes? And this was an easy case for the court. The court said we have absolutely no indication that there's a religious right to poison somebody, even if the poisons come from a certain religion. And so the point is, is that bad people make claims all the time under RIFRA. They try to justify their crimes. They try to justify domestic violence. Just as bad people make, you know, people who were actual criminals make arguments under the Fourth Amendment that the search that discovered the dead body in their trunk ought to be suppressed. That doesn't mean we ought to throw out the Fourth Amendment, right? It doesn't mean we ought to throw out RIFRA. It just means that we ought to say, hey, there's not a right under RIFRA to do violence against somebody or to poison somebody. And that's what the court said, and it was an easy case. Does that make sense? So yeah, I think that's the, that's the way we can say that, that RIFRA actually got this case right. Tim, I agree with that, but let's go a little counterfactual on this, right? So the facts in this case, for those not familiar with it, is this gentleman became upset at his wife uh, because she couldn't have children, tries to divorce her, she won't agree to it. Not sure why he just didn't unilaterally divorce her, but he instead consults a voodoo practitioner in Haiti 
who then prescribes a certain amount of, we call them spells, but what they really were just different poisons uh, and tries to get them. One point tries to poison her in Haiti, that fails, tries to import a poison, that doesn't clear customs. Finally, he succeeds. So, I mean, you can talk about this being a religious spell, but at the end of the day, these were just poisons that work regardless of your belief in voodooism. But let's say, for instance, the argument was different, that he had gone to this voodoo practitioner who had not used poisons, but you simply used, you know, a doll or something, and the person had died as a result of that. Uh, would that just sort of general practice, would that be predicted? What if they tried to charge him and say, listen, your wife died because you went to this practitioner, put a curse on her, no poisons involved, nothing like that, but you just put a religious curse on her and she died as a result of that. Would that be actionable? No. <laughs> I yeah. actually think under I, I don't I think it would be it would you'd have a hard time. The problem wouldn't be that it, that he would be protected by Riffer, although maybe he would be. I think the issue is more that you'd really have a hard time sustaining a conviction because you'd have a causation issue, right? You'd have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the curse caused her death to a court. Like that's hey, I believe in the supernatural, man, but causation beyond a reasonable doubt in that case, I don't know that any jury. You know, I think you'd have a directed verdict in that case against. I think Dr. Golden, who's tried a lot of of, of criminal cases, would that would be the argument you would make, right? This is a you, you have a causation issue beyond a reasonable doubt, and no reasonable jury could find that this beyond a reasonable doubt caused the death of his wife. Uh, under well, unless the, unless you had a, a hypersensitive uh, person, and the person knew this person was hypersensitive, and knew that you know construing a certain chain of events would, in fact, lead to that person's demise. And in, in, in that case, you, you can probably make the argument. But uh, there's something else I think we're missing here. Um, I, I think it's problematic that somebody is too religious to get a divorce, but not too religious to murder somebody. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I think there's a problem there. And I also think it's a problem. Uh, you can you can swing your arm all you want to, but your right to swing your arm ends where my nose begins. And I think that uh, to have the um, unmitigated gall to try and couch your bad behavior uh, in a religious setting, hey, we'll give you an A for effort. But at the end of the day, the, the principles here uh, are pretty clear. But Tim yeah, Golden, let more, me ask you this yeah. though, the idea of what Todd is mentioning, to start talking about cause and effect, from a religious perspective, there are people who believe that they pray and certain results happen. There are people who believe that there are certain actions they engage in that re results in things that the rest of the world would say they have no connection. So to kind of say that from a religious standpoint, cause and effect might necessarily need to be connected from a legal perspective, it almost pushes back against what you know religion can really be about in the eyes of an individual. Well, it, do it does, and but I have to side with Tim Schultz on this one. Right. I mean, if you're going to prove somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you can have all kinds of causal beliefs about the efficacy of your prayer life. Mm -hmm. You can have all kinds of causal beliefs about the efficacy of a mojo that you twist the knee and the person's leg suddenly breaks. Right. I mean, we can have all kinds of beliefs. But in the end, when you talk about legal accountability, if we're going to hold people accountable from a legal standpoint, you you have to have causal connections that are that are clearer and that are more firmly established. And in this case, you do. I mean, if I could just pick up on what Dr. Brown said a moment ago, he just articulated very nicely a uh, principle in political philosophy known as the harm principle, right? By John Stuart Mill. Mm -hmm. The state can't come after me for doing anything that I want to do unless what I what it is that I want to do is somehow doing harm to another person. And this case is the classical example. When people ask me, well, what is a compelling state interest mm -hmm. that will override <laughs> my right to freely exercise my religion? This is it. You can't kill anybody in the name of your religion, right? You can't, <laughs> this, is, this is the classic textbook example of a compelling state interest. And so, it, you you just there's certain things you just can't do, and I think we have to separate spiritual beliefs about a prayer and God and religion from the legal consequences of those beliefs, which I think have to be judged by very different standards. 
Well, Todd, what is the potential connection with RIFRA here that made this particular argument think that that connection had anything to do with the fact that a woman died at the end? Somehow someone thought that there was some type of quote unquote, you know, understanding of RIFRA that may explain this. How did they even try to connect the dots on that? Well, I suspect, I mean, what is in the appellants, you know, the, the, the accused uh, favor is he did consult a religious practitioner, right? Like he didn't just go to somebody, you know, who sold these kind of drugs, you know, on, on the uh, and poisons. He did consult a religious practitioner. There does appear to have been a certain level of religious uh, rituals and so forth that were conducted as part of this. And the court doesn't really take issue with that. It doesn't really say this wasn't religious. What they say is you just don't have a religious right to try to kill somebody. And I think that was the appropriate way to go. And I will say in this case, it doesn't appear as like this was just something he made up, right? That he killed his wife and then, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, this was part of voodoo. I mean, it does appear this was part of his religious belief leading up to it. But the court did the right thing here by just taking all his fact and saying, oh, by the way, um, you know, uh, you just don't get to do that even if it is your religious belief. You know, I think one of the interesting concepts that we see that we are trying to really get a handle on is where do you draw the line between rituals, religious beliefs, and where do you draw the line in a way in which society has to really recognize it? You know, as we keep moving forward in life and finding new religions, new ideas, protection that fall under this specific definition, uh, we're going to find more and more groups every day trying to figure out how do I paint myself as being a religious entity? This happened because of my religious beliefs. And I think as a society, we've got to be careful. But I think this is something we're going to talk about for a very, very long time. Todd, tell me something I don't know. The first United States military chaplain was authorized by Congress in 1791. The Reverend John Hurt of Virginia was the chaplain of the 6th Virginia Regiment during the American Revolution. We have a long history of chaplains in the United States. Didn't know that one. Lawrence, tell me something I don't know. Speaking of dangerous religious rituals, there is a place in southern India, and as far as we know, this is the only place that it happens, where people go to the top of a temple and throw babies off the temple into a blanket down below. This is done by parents hoping to have another child. And it says to me, maybe you shouldn't have another one if you don't know how to take care of the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Golden, tell me something I don't know. November 15th of this year is the 38th anniversary of Edwin Mises. Ed Edwin Mises, former Ronald Reagan Attorney General, of his address before the D.C. chapter of the Federalist Society Lawyers Division, in which he fo first spoke of an original understanding of the Constitution. What followed was a, a landslide of activity around this doctrine called originalism that Justice Scalia legitimized on the court, but ultimately is grounded in Ed Meese's political rhetoric. Mm. <laughs> Tim Schultz, tell me something I don't know. Well, we, um, we've had chaplain programs for a long time. I continue to say that the best chaplain in the United States, of course, is United States Senate Chaplain Barry Black, who, of course, is a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, also uh, co-officiated my wedding. Wow, did not know that. <laughs> Gentlemen, we appreciate the conversation. Wow, interesting dialogue today, but we know this isn't going to end here. Thanks again for being with us today. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. Just remember, if it's about God and government, it's faith and politics. See you next time.